In this video, we're going to talk about Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, also abbreviated WFS. And um, before we get into this, I uh, just want to mention a couple of terms. The first is bacteremia. And most of you already know what this means, but I just wanted to refresh. Bacteremia is, of course, uh, uh, bacteria in the blood. Anything emia is in the blood. And then there's another term that is more severe than bacteremia, and that's uh, septicemia. And that's basically when bacteremia, in layman's terms, is very severe and can lead to uh, our organ failure and coma and shock. And so severe bacteremia, the easiest way of remembering it. All right, so let's get into what WFS actually is. So there's a few players involved. Uh, there's a there's a bacteria and there's an organ. And the bacteria there's there's several bacteria that can cause this, but the most common by far is uh, Neisseria. And in particular, Neisseria meningitidis. Now, Neisseria meningitidis is also known as meningococcus. It, it's another name given. So you, you'll see these it, it used interchangeably, uh, meningococcus or Neisseria meningitidis. That's the bacteria that's involved. There's other uh, pathogens that can cause WFS, uh, WFS, but this is the main, most common one. The organ is the adrenal gland, so that's important to remember. So what's happening here? What um, is going on? Well, the adrenal gland has a hemorrhage, and the hemorrhage is basically the result of infection with that meningococcus. So the bacterial infection uh, leads to this massive hemorrhage. And it can be bo uh, usually both, but it can be one or, or both of the adrenal glands leads to that. And bacterial infection with what? With the meningococcus. So that's really what's the main cascade or main path that's happening is that you have an infection with the, the meningococcus pathogen, and it's a very severe, overwhelming infection that leads to uh, bacteremia. Uh, and then eventually, it's, it becomes a very severe, as I said, uh, infection that leads to septicemia, and that can eventually cause this adrenal gland hemorrhage. And when the adrenal gland uh, hemorrhage occurs, the adrenal gland uh, fails. So then you have failure of the adrenal gland. And when you have adrenal gland failure, that's what really causes all the symptomatology. So before I get into the symptoms of WFS, remember we have adrenal gland failure. So instead of listing the, all the symptoms and trying to just memorize them, let's talk a little bit about the adrenal gland. And that way you probably won't have to memorize the symptoms. The symptoms will make sense. Well, if you remember the adrenal gland, if if you have a cross-section, it has different layers, you might remember. And each layer produces a, a different hormone. And I'm just going to talk about uh, two hormones, aldosterone and cortisol. So normally, the adren adrenal gland produces aldosterone and cortisol. Aldosterone, if you remember, is uh, responsible for regulation of blood pressure. It brings sodium back from the uh, nephron of the kidney and it kicks out potassium. And when it brings sodium back, water usually comes back with it. So water comes back from the kidney into the blood vessels and that uh, regulates blood pressure. Cortisol is, uh, has many functions in the body. Uh, it increases blood sugar and it's also responsible for uh, a lot of uh, metabolism-related uh, acts, such as uh, metabolism of fat and protein and carbohydrates. So remember these two players. Now, if you have adrenal gland failure, those hormones, because they're from the adrenal gland, will be either low or, or might even be so low that they're just not even uh, producing their normal uh, actions on the body. So. If you don't have aldosterone, you're not maintaining your blood pressure, so you'll have low blood pressure. And this is in WFS because WFS is essentially adrenal gland failure due to hemorrhage. 
caused by that meningococcus uh, pathogen. So that's the first symptom. So we're starting to list the symptoms now. Second one is if you have low blood sugar because the cortisol is not there to uh, help uh, with gluconeogenesis. Now, some of these other symptoms um, kind of present nonspecifically. Now, remember Neisseria, if you remember, the, the, the second part of the name of this pathogen kind of hints at what it actually does in the body. If this word sounds like meningitis, there's a reason for that, because it does. So some of the symptoms of WFS closely resemble meningitis, and those include fever, headache, um, HA is my abbreviation for headache. Sometimes I abbreviate things and maybe you're not aware of what it means. Uh, stiff neck. So like I said, instead of memorizing this, kind of try to understand why this is happening. So these are definitely some of the uh, initial symptoms and the low blood pressure can be so low in fact that it can lead to shock. So these are some of the more, more um, easier to understand symptoms. Now, another symptom that can happen, a uh, physical exam finding, is a rash. And it's a petechial rash. It can be petechial or purpuric in nature. And it can appear across the hands or the face or the arms. You remember that, and that's important. Okay, so you have somebody that comes into the ER. They've got low blood pressure. Um, they've got... Um, a lot of uh, neurologic symptoms, you know, headache, a, st a stiff neck. Uh, they've got a little um, a rash that I just mentioned, uh, and and they're they're in shock. Uh, it's very very uh, ill person, very impressive uh, presentation. What kind of uh, how are you going to diagnose this? Well, almost always, you are going to try to do either cultures or gram stain to identify a pathogen. Clearly, this person is, has an infection, and you can do uh, this from the blood or the CSF by doing a lumbar puncture. And lumbar punctures are commonly done in the diagnostic workup of meningitis. Uh, that's the first part of the diagnosis. The second part is you most likely, if you really do suspect WFS, uh, you will most likely have to do an abdominal CT and that abdominal CT will show the adrenal glands. And it will show that the adrenal glands indeed have hemorrhage, hemorrhagic adrenal gland. It will show the hemorrhages. Other tests that are very important are cortisol. Remember, cortisol comes from the um, adrenal gland. And then the CMP, the comprehensive metabolic profile, will show hypoglycemia. It will also show the characteristic uh, electrolyte abnormalities when you don't have, uh, uh, when you have low levels of aldosterone, which are hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. That's when you have low levels or absent aldosterone. So this is a very, very important uh, diagnostic workup. So how do you treat this? How do you treat WFS? Well, there's, there's about four things. There's a lot of ways to uh, approach this is most likely in the ICU, but there's four fundamental things, and that is antibiotics to attack that pathogen, and most commonly penicillin is used. And there's other, uh, like uh, chloramphenicol, ceftriaxone, if the person is allergic to penicillin. The next thing is you want to uh, give the person steroids because their adrenal gland has failed and is not producing the cortisol, so this can help reverse the shock and the low blood pressure. Uh, low, blood pressure is also maintained with IV fluids and also catecholamines. Remember catecholamines like epinephrine, norepinephrine are produced by the adrenal medulla and uh, because those are um, either low or absent because of a, the adrenal gland failing, these are given. And um, this is a medical emergency, so there most likely will be a lot of uh, supportive care uh, in the management of this very severe disorder. I want to go through uh, some clinical vignettes about WFS to get an idea of what it will be like on a licensing exam. So the first one, a 25-year-old summer camp counselor complains of severe headache and weakness. 
His condition rapidly deteriorates over a period of hours, and he is airlifted to a nearby hospital. A lumbar puncture is performed, and a gram stain of spinal fluid reveals gram negative diplococci. I'm trying to draw what they look like. Infection with this organism is also associated with which of the following? Okay, well, kind of a difficult question, I think. Doesn't give you a lot of information. Well, one thing we know for sure is he has neurologic symptoms. You know, this severe headache, for example. And then he deteriorates very quickly. So the severity is sort of illustrated in this question stem. Uh, lumbar puncture is performed, so the CSF has been analyzed, and it shows these gram-negative diplococci. Now, it, it's helpful to know that gram-negative diplococci are what Neisseria are. Neisseria are gram-negative diplococci. And um, what the question is asking, basically, is which of these is most likely affected. Now, Neisseria has a couple different types. Uh, there's Neisseria meningitidis, which is the one that we were talking about. And then there's Neisseria gonorrhea, if you remember, and gonorrhea. Now, in this presentation, there's nothing uh, in the clinical vignette that talks anything about any kind of uh, sexually transmitted disease or or discharge or anything like that. So it's most likely not this uh, type of Neisseria. It's most likely the meningitis form. And the fact that it's gram-negative diplococci kind of helps. Well, kind of go through this here. Dysentery is usually not caused by Neisseria meningitis. It's usually caused by Shigella or, you know, other uh, uh, pathogens involved in uh, diarrhea. Erythema chronica migrans is actually a, a rash that's associated with Lyme disease. Lyme disease. And that's uh, uh, not uh, caused by Neisseria meningitis. Uh, Bacterio my myocarditis and um, type of uh, bacterial infection is usually, uh, usually staph or, or some other organism. And um, the Thalmia neonotorum, that's usually caused by Neisseria gonorrhea, which is over here. Um, now, you might say, well, they do mention that it's gram-negative diplococci, so how do you know it's not Neisseria gonorrhea? Well, because the question stem doesn't talk anything about those types of symptomatologies like STD or penile discharge. So that leaves you with waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome, or WFS. All right, let's go to the next one. A previously healthy 22-year-old man comes to his college medical clinic for headaches and low-grade fevers. His, he is discharged home with a diagnosis of viral syndrome and instructed to get ample rest. Approximately three hours later, his roommate calls 911, reporting that his friend is unconscious and not arousable. On arrival, the paramedics find a lethargic, febrile man lying on the floor and unresponsive. Patient is stabilized and rushed to emergently to the local hospital where an abdominal CT scan shows bilateral adrenal hemorrhages. Blood pressure is very low, 80 over 40, pulse is 110. He's very ill and continues to be non-responsive, the most appropriate study at this time. Okay, well, the thing is, uh, these two, which kind of immediately come to mind because that does stimulate the uh, adrenal gland, it's a great test, but the problem is it takes 24 hours to perform. 24 hours is a long time, and this is an emergent situation, so that's out. Um, the quartz stim test is actually also an ACTH test. and uh, But uh, this too uh, can be time-consuming, so that's out. So you're really left with B or D. And between B and D... What we're trying to use is what's the quickest, because this is a medical emergency, what they're saying is the most appropriate. And of those two, the the most appropriate is the cortisol level. That can be done immediately. And if it is low, which it most likely will be, there's enough in this uh, clinical uh, vignette to point to WFS, then uh, that can confirm the diagnosis. And finally, a 23-year-old woman 
is brought to the emergency department by ambulance. She is accompanied by a roommate who states that the patient developed a fever and some confusion three hours before, approximately 30 minutes ago, became unconscious. The roommate reports that the patient was complaining of stiff neck and headache a few hours before she became ill. The roommate knows of no significant medical history, but reports that the patient is a volunteer at a local children's hospital. Initial exam shows the patient to be non-responsive, temperature is very high, 104.7, blood pressure is very low, 70 over 40, pulse 140, respiration is 32. There are diffuse petechial and purpuric lesions across the hands, face, and arms. After tracheal intubation, infusion of pressors fail to augment the blood pressure and it remains at 65 over 35. Most appropriate next step is... Okay, well again, another uh, classic uh, WFS uh, vignette. And what's happening here is this patient is really just going into shock. Uh, adrenal uh, glands are hemorrhaged and failed. And um, they've tried very, very hard to get this blood pressure up uh, 70 over 40, they've given um, these pressors, which are medications, of course, and the blood pressure is actually continues to drop. So you have to emergently try to get this blood pressure up. And the answers to this include corticosteroids, IV fluids, and of course, antibiotics. So this, this is really just a, a, a classic vignette that's talking about the treatment of WFS. And uh, remember, the antibiotic is to uh, attack the pathogen, which is most likely uh, meningococcus, also known as Neisseria meningitidis. And the corticosteroids and IV fluids are given in an attempt to uh, um, reverse the septic shock that she's gone into, uh, clearly outlined by this very low blood pressure.